Hi, right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I don't know where you are in the world or what you are doing right now, but I just had lunch. And it has this amazing effect on you. Uh, unlike any other meal of the day, lunchtime is a difficult one to deal with. So, you know, our South Africans, we love to eat. It's just one of our trademarks. And uh, in fact, uh, we are probably the country in Africa which consumes the most meat, red meat of, of all. So, yeah, the more north you go, the less meat people eat. But I have learned, I've learned, I've learned, I've learned. So we are just, um, <laughs> we are just uh, learning. So, yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to share actually something very serious this afternoon. Um, that was just on a lighter note. But before we continue, let us just pray. Father, I thank you that you have blessed us this week so much with all kinds of blessings. And we are so full of the abundance of what you have shared with us in terms of your word and revelation and the spirit of knowledge that comes our way through your spirit. And we thank you that we are not alone in this world, but you have given us the Holy Spirit to lead us, to cover us, to protect us, to take us along this road and to reveal the heart of the Father to us. And we are grateful this afternoon that we can even in the practical day and the walking with you, we can also see your hand at work. So I pray that you will give us guidance this afternoon and even in the very small physical thing that your spirit will be at work. I thank you that you are raising up people all over the nations that will be calling, that will be standing on the walls of their communities and their cities until you answer. And so this is uh, what we are praying for this afternoon that you will raise up day and night watchmen, leaders, intercessors, missionaries, pastors, evangelists, apostles, everywhere, Lord, where you desire your church and your kingdom to come. Let them be raised up through your spirit and stand on the walls and call upon your name. We ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to zoom in a little bit this afternoon more on the practical side and more the strategic side of 24-7 day and night prayer. This is one of the reasons why we have the Watchman School of Prayer is to equip and to, in, to encourage day and night prayer everywhere. That is the, the bottom line. Now, as we have shared uh, two days ago also, we are seeing that God is raising up day and night prayer and establishing day and night prayer networks and prayer watches all over the place, in South Africa and beyond, in different parts of the world, etc. I want to share a few thoughts on prayer, day and night prayer, but especially around movements of prayer this afternoon, movements of prayer. We hear every now and then people talk of this prayer movement and that prayer movement, and I just want to put this a little bit in a context. You know, when the Spirit of God comes, like he did in New York that we shared two days ago, where Jeremiah Lamphere was calling for a um, lunchtime prayer meeting and only one person came, we are actually trusting the Lord. One person comes, there's an individual that pray. When five people come, there's a prayer meeting. When those five people become more than one group, you are starting to talk about a prayer network of different groups. When you have different prayer networks that develop out of that one prayer network, then you start calling, talking about a movement of prayer. But it's not the other way around. When the movement really gets out of hand and the fire of the Holy Spirit comes, then we start talking about revival. But it's not the other way around. I hear some people, they say, oh, we're going to call for this prayer movement. But then they not, don't have any individual yet praying. So we must be careful how we talk about the prayer movement because sometimes we think there's a lot of people praying. Let me just explain this a little bit further. At some point in the, 
history where I was uh, mobilizing prayer for the city. We had 60 churches, each taking one day a month to pray 24-7 for the city. And at some point after three years, as we were sending faxes out in those days, on a monthly basis, sending them faxes with all the guidelines, they were praying very faithfully and so on. But after three years, I thought by myself, what? Uh, let me just find out if all of them are still on the wall of the city. And I phoned them, and I talked to them, and I asked them some feedback, how many people are praying, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then I discovered that only a third of them were still praying. And then I got, firstly, I got very discouraged. And then I decided, no, this is a reality check. This is, this is just a reality check. And I've been walking and talking and sharing and testifying about these 60 churches that are praying in the city. And they were actually 20. So it became a story of integrity for me. I couldn't walk like that. And so I've been very, very careful not to overstep or overstate the condition of the prayer movement. And if I can say today, there are less people praying than you think. We have uh, time, some time back, I made a study of a little exercise by myself. And I discovered what we all thought was the truth. That in this very day, where we don't have revival, but there's signs of prayer. We have, you can take it like this. All over South Africa, maybe beyond South Africa, this is a reality. If you take all the people in a community that say they are Christian, maybe 10% of them will attend church on a regular basis. Of those 10% that visit the church once a week, maybe 10% will attend a regular prayer meeting. And of a regular prayer meeting attendee, you can say they more or less have a personal prayer life. But that is how big the prayer movement really is. If, we, if you would ask me in terms of numbers, how big is the prayer movement, that is the reality. And that is a serious problem. Because that equals prayerlessness in the general sense. And so for us, even as we are sitting here, Many of us would say, personally, you know, I'm not praying enough. Personally, I feel the Lord needs to actually um, encourage me to pray more, to have more time with him, to set more time apart. In fact, some of us may even say, my life is too busy. Life is too fast for me. I don't have time to sit down without my mind running all over the place. This is a stronghold. And somehow the Lord has to help us to break this cycle. Now, when we talk of watchmen, I'm talking about every person that prays or intercedes for something. A watchman, can I say, what is a watchman doing? The biblical term of a watchman. And in a very simple definition, what does a watchman do? He watches and he prays. That's a very basic thing of a watchman. He watches and he prays. Now, a very deep thing for the last days that we are living in, because when we look at scripture, then we see just before Jesus was arrested, in Matthew 28 verse 41, Jesus says to his disciples, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Then, in Matthew 26, verse 44, Jesus is talking the same thing. And he says, are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise and let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Now, there's many reasons we can say why the disciples were reluctant to pray for an hour with Jesus. Well, one of the things was, of course, they, they knew something was going to come down that, that evening in the garden. Something is about to happen, and they were very uncomfortable about this. They were tired emotionally. They were physically tired, probably. 
And at the, on the other end, they didn't really know what Jesus' problem was. Why was he so in turmoil? They, they couldn't really grasp that, I think. But Jesus encouraged them the whole time, pray. Pray. Now, he said, watch and pray, be watchful and pray, be alert, not to fall into temptation. What happened to Peter in his zeal was, he cut off Malchus' ear, and Jesus had to heal it again. Because he was acting in the flesh. He didn't understand the, 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 the meaning of the moment. And then later on, he would actually deny Jesus three times. In his zeal. He was following Jesus. I mean, all the other disciples were gone already. They were fleeing. But Peter was very boldly trying to follow where Jesus is. But in the process, he denied him three times when he got scared. Now, this is the thing. In the last days, when things get difficult and the pressure comes, this is the position we need to take. Watch and pray. Be watchful and pray. That you will not fall in a place when the pressure comes and you are pressured to make a decision between Jesus or not. That you will fall into the temptation to deny him. There's all sorts of testimonies of the Middle Eastern Christians that have been persecuted unto death and they've never rejected Jesus. So we live in a time and space where this is reality. But we also need to hear this, that we need to be watchful and pray at all times. And isn't it so that when we pray, our spirit is alert, our faith is increasing, and we are in a spiritual place where we will have strength to overcome. And this is why Jesus encouraged us to pray. It is a heartfelt connection with the Lord. Now, what is the mandate of the watchman? In Habakkuk, the book of Habakkuk, chapter 2, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1. In Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1, it says the following. These, in, these, in this very one verse, we find four things which describes the very mandate of the watchman. It says the following. I will stand my watch and station myself on the ramparts, that is the walls of the city. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I will give to this complaint. Here we're reading four things. The first one is, I will stand at my watch. This, is a, this watch talks about a time frame. I will stand my watch. I have a responsibility to watch over the city for a period of time. And I will resolve in myself to stand. Now in those days, secondly, he says, I will station myself on the ramparts. He says, I will take my watch on the city walls. Those ramparts are city walls. Now in the old days, even today still, we have cities with walls around it for protection. And on those walls, you have gaps and you have little towers. And they used to station the watchmen right in the middle of the gap. So that for every gap on the wall, there needs to be a watchman in place. For protection, but also for some other reasons. And so it is that when we put ourselves into a place of intercession for the city, we are actually taking position on the spiritual walls of our city or our community. And thirdly, there is also this dimension where it says, I will look to see what he will say to me. So there's this expectation of the watchman that when he stands for his watch and is alert and awake, he is looking in the spirit. He is looking for the enemy, but he's looking also towards the Lord right here. He says, I will look to see what he will say to me. 
So his eye is on the Lord. And then he's waiting for the answer. Only then it says what the answer is that he is to give. So even his answer towards the, what he sees in the Spirit is a form of prayer. And is generated by the Holy Spirit. So there's a whole activity of the watchman from seeing, from listening, from watching, from hearing, from answering. It's all about the watchman's doing. That is what we need to do when we watch over the city. This is the activity. And unfortunately, these days on Zoom and other platforms, because of the lockdown that we are in, it's so difficult to spend time in all these dimensions of a watchman. Because it's normally just this supplicational prayer that we can find working well on a, on, a, on, a, on a social media platform. Or one person at a time praying. It's very limited. <laughs> it's such a tragedy. But then the door is open now. And we can meet two or three or four or five. We can meet together. And so this is the mandate of the watchman in Habakkuk 2 verse 1. So we see that the watchman's um, activity on the wall has everything to do with a conversation. It's a conversation. It's a, it's a person watching over the city that has a heart connection with the Lord. He can hear, he can see, he can taste, and he can answer the Lord. So this is important. Then, when we talk about day and night prayer, many, many things, and movements of prayer, let me just encourage you. In South Africa, we are currently having leaders that are raised up with, with global prayer ministries. Now, it's very interesting when we talk movements of prayer that in the year 1999, something very significant happened. It was sort of the birthing year for the modern-day day and night prayer movement. In that September of that year, the year 1999, there was a prayer movement that started in the United States in Kansas City, which is built around Harp and Bowl, where young people will pray two hours at a time, just praying like we are praying here in the evening, with worship, singing spontaneously, and prayer. They would pray the Bible, sing the Bible, read the Bible, two hours at a time, and then they will just continue. The next team comes in, and so they continue. And since September 1999, up till today, they've never stopped. They now have more than a thousand young adults uh, on their premises that would be part of that 24-7 prayer watch. And it's raising up, if that's the only thing it is doing, it's raising up a fragrance unto God that is pleasing to him. And then, of course, that spread all over the world. In different nations, you will find this in our own doing, in our house of prayer, and all the uh, different kinds of houses of prayer around the country. We have adopted some of that principles, and we are using it. Even the spontaneous movement of worship that you find these days in worship services comes out of prayer altars like that. The whole spontaneous prayer worship thing. And then also on the other side of the ocean, in um, Reading in, in England, there was a group of young adults that got together. They felt the Lord is calling them to day and night prayer. And they set aside the week of prayer and decided they're going to pray for a month in a very old factory venue. So they cleaned it up and they entered in there, opened their Bible, started praying and seeking the Lord day and night. After a month or three, the Lord came and visited them. And the Holy Spirit encouraged them, and they continued to pray. And so the whole boiler room movement was being birthed in England. That is, the whole thing of a creative space of prayer, physical room, where people can move from wall to wall and be encouraged by what they read and see on the walls. And that movement has grown beyond 60 nations now. They are still going. These movements are still continuing. In South Africa also, which started out in 2001, 
In March 2001, a prayer meeting in, in, at the Newland Stadium in Cape Town of 45,000 Christians have very quickly grown after a few years to touching every continent, every country around the world. Global Day of Prayer, a prayer meeting once a year took place in all the nations of the world being birthed in Cape Town. And so we are seeing many people, and this encourages the belief in the prophetic words that say there will be a fire that will start at the southern point of Africa, and it will spread across the nations of Africa and right into the world. We have never in the history of South Africa seen a strong outpouring like that. Only a regional one that haven't touched the whole country. But yet the Lord is saying in the last days, I want to pour out my spirit on the continent of Africa in such a way that the whole continent will be touched with the fire. And so for my friends that are listening now in Africa and nations of Zimbabwe and Zambia, Malawi, the Lord is on the move. And so we have seen movements of prayer going up Africa, preparing the way for the Lord to come. Why do we need to pray 24-7 prayer? Where does it come from? There's five places in the Bible you will read of this. Romans 8 verse 34 tells us where Jesus is right now. It says Jesus has risen. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. And he's doing what? He's interceding for us as the church. That's what he's doing. And it says he's doing it day and night. He's sitting next to the Father praying for us continuously. And when we are praying here on earth 24-7, then we are agreeing with what Jesus is doing. We are listening to him. We are watching our commander. We are watching our watchman. And we are listening and seeing and answering his requests. And so this is important. Why? There's two dimensions to day and night prayer. There's the one of corporate, where we take an hour on an hour on an hour to pray as a body. But there's also an individual dimension where Paul and those guys in the New Testament say, this is why I want you to pray continuously. Why Jesus encouraged the widow in Luke 18 to pray continuously. This is an attitude of the heart that is set upon God day and night. Doesn't matter what time of day. If you ask her what she's thinking about, she's thinking about Jesus and how he will answer her. This is the attitude of day and night prayer. It's a status of prayer that you find yourself in. And not many people have that. But it's possible for everyone to be connected in that way. And so, first reason of day and night prayer is Jesus is praying with us. Secondly, we find the transformation of a city can happen through day and night prayer. There we see Isaiah 62, verse 6 and 7, which is actually a promise that God will make your city a praise in the earth. He will let his glory subside in your city. And he says, the reason is, I've set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. They will never be silent. Day and night they will continue to remind me of my promises until I come and I make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. So we see that the Lord is appointing watchmen. He's putting them into place on the walls of the city. And he's doing it because he has a holy purpose for your community and for your city. He wants your city to glorify him and to be a praise and a witness in the earth. This is why he's setting day and night watchmen. It's a promise of the Lord. And then thirdly, we find that day and night prayer is also has to do with the leasing of the harvest. In Acts 15, verse 16 and 17, it says this. It says, in the last days, God will come and he will restore the tabernacle of David. He will raise it up again. He will restore its very ruins. And then he says, so that the remnant of men may come into his kingdom. This is the promise. God says, why I take my church and I pour out my spirit of day and night devotion upon my church. While they are doing this, and this incense rise before my, before my face, while they are doing this, I will draw the people of the world into my kingdom. And so we see in many times of visitation and revival, 
where the Spirit of God is being poured out. Thousands of people gather in a place as they are drawn, even hearing in the Spirit that there's somewhere people gathering to, 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 to worship the Lord. And so people will come. The unsaved will come because they see the fire and they see, I want to be like that. And they come. And then fourthly, we see that God is able to transform and bring justice to communities and even to nations. In Luke 18, verse 7 and 8, Jesus personally talks to his disciples when he explains the story of the widow that went to the judge and asked him to um, decide in her favor. And the judge just refused. But it says this was an unjust judge. And Jesus explains, and then he says, but this woman, she would just continue going to the judge until he said, let me rather grant this woman what she wants before she tires me out. And it's uh, simply say that. So then Jesus tells his disciples, his chosen ones, he said, this is why I want you to pray continuously. And he says, and will not God, who is a righteous God, Will not he grant justice to his chosen ones when they cry to him day and night? He will do it, and he will do it quickly, as the Bible says. Now, quickly is another term, you know, because 20 years ago, we were already praying for against corruption, and for 20 years, <laughs> things didn't happen. And then suddenly, a few years back, you would hear suddenly people popping up. The truth will come out. And people will be arrested and, um, and lose their jobs because of corruption. And suddenly we are in a season where God is dealing with corruption in, in our country and beyond. But Jesus says, if you cry out to me with your whole heart and you give me no rest, I will come. I will come. One day the Lord gave me a picture of day and night prayer altar where people will pray and they will serious pray around one theme. And then I saw the picture of this, um, this water drill, you know, the, the, the machine they use to drill for water. And um, they would drill and drill and drill and sometimes as they go deeper, deeper, deeper looking for the water, sometimes they will have hard rock and it will be very difficult to drill. And it, the process go very slowly and lots of friction and so on. And other times there would be sand and the drilling will go very easily. And they, they quickly went down deeper. And so it is with prayer. So it is with day and night prayer. Sometimes there's so much resistance. But in spite of the resistance, you encourage one another and you can keep on praying. And sometimes it's easy. Sometimes the atmosphere is open and it's easy to pray. But then at some point where this drilling goes, it's meant to hit the water. And the only thing that keeps you going is the promise that the water will come. And so we need to continue because when we hit the water, that water will come out with a pressure that is so high it will just spread spring out into the air, and it will wet all over the community. The water will fall. And this is the picture, that if we would encourage ourselves in the Lord, and the Lord will give us grace to stand on the wall day and night, as many of you have done, even at this time. We have about 30 networks, 24-7 watches in South Africa that have never stopped praying since the beginning of lockdown. They're still praying. They're still praying and calling out to God day and night. They pray for revival, even more intensely than before. And they pray for justice. They pray for healing and restoration of the nation. But they continue. And then the, the fifth and last instance why we need to pray day and night, we find in Revelations 5 verse 8. And maybe we had a glimpse of this last night. While we were worshiping and entering the presence of God. Not that he's not with us, but sometimes the presence of God is so evident. It's so real. You can feel it. 
And in Revelation 5, verse 8, it talks about the 24 elders and the four living creatures, which would worship the Lord day and night within their one hand, the golden bowl full of incense, which is the prayers of the saints, and in the other hand, the harp. And they would bow before the throne, and 24-7, day and night, they will worship the Lord in that manner. And so it is that when we pray our Father's prayer, and we say, Lord, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. One of the manifestations of that prayer is when the church of Jesus Christ starts rising up in day and night worship and prayer. That's why we do this thing. Now, very quickly, I'm going to touch on a few practical things because you know what? They said once, somebody said, there's three types of people in ministry. You get visionaries. Those are the guys that see these wonderful dreams and visions. And uh, I'm not talking about these spiritual dreams. I'm talking about somebody that, that actually get a revelation and instruction from the Lord that he's going to do something big. But in order to get this vision fulfilled, you need a person that will be an implementer. So you get visionaries who sees where God wants to go with the church. And then you get an implementer, which is the person that implements that vision. He gets the strategies and the plans the Lord revealed to him, and then he implements it. And thirdly, what is a vision if you can't sustain it? You need a sustainer. You need a person that can keep on going, keep on doing small, regular steps, and just do the regular stuff on and on and on. And so big works of the kingdom is built with small steps of obedience on a long term. Can I say that again? Big works of the kingdom is being established by small steps of obedience on a long term. Someone once said that God takes a long time to move suddenly. God takes a long time to move suddenly. This is the deal. Once they said to a guy, no, please, you must stop praying now for revival. Do you think God still wants to answer? He said, no. You think God will keep me praying for revival if he doesn't want to send revival? And so can I encourage you with this? We had the lockdown. We had COVID. We had all these kind of difficulty. But the Lord brought us back to our inner closet. He canceled all the corporate meetings. And he said, I want you to go back to your inner closet. Because some of us, our spiritual life, were so defined by corporate meetings that, that we didn't have a, uh, a prayer life in our inner closet. And so the Lord had to do something drastic to push us back into our inner closet. But this is... This is the Lord. This is the Lord. This is how he works. So, practical few things. This is just from my own experience. And uh, many of you will actually be also having implemented this already. But let me just encourage you with this. There's five steps that, will key, that are keys to effective ongoing day and night prayer. And the first one is you have to constantly look out for people and invite them to join and take an hour on the wall. And don't be scared. We have had times in the past, maybe 10 to 55 years ago, five years ago maybe, you would have people, Christians, that would only be able to pray one hour a week. Then the lockdown came, and suddenly people were praying one hour a day on, an, on a WhatsApp group. And the momentum of prayer increased overnight. So much so that today where we are standing now, people haven't stopped praying one hour a day. They maybe pray half an hour of that hour, but they haven't stopped praying once a day. This is an increase of exponential growth since about two years ago. So the first thing is you have to invite people. You have to mobilize people to take specific hours. 
Secondly, you have to provide daily prayer focus and prayer information. You can use this. We are sending some of it out. We have since the lockdown started, we discovered we have to send out daily 24-7 prayer pointers because we have a number of networks that keep on praying. They don't just pray every seventh week. So we had to com continue with that. It's providing a weekly theme with daily focus on prayer. And then thirdly, you need to limit the traffic on a WhatsApp group. Don't, you have to have protocols on your WhatsApp group. You must decide what do you want, what is it that people are allowed to post and what not. Otherwise, people will post heavy stuff, big teachings, long hours of stuff and video clips, and it will just take up everybody's data. And you know when you think you have Wi-Fi 24-7, then then just remember that most people don't have that. It's a luxury to have 24-7 Wi-Fi at your house. So be careful how much um, things you post on a group like this. But to log in and to log out is the bare, bare minimum of, of the traffic on your group. You want them to log in, log out. And that is the fourth one in sustaining day and night prayer is have people on the wall to log in and log out for their specific hour. And they can share a scripture or something they, they experience. But the bottom line is to log in and log out. The reason for that, you find people, it's very difficult for some people to do that. But the reason is a mutual accountability. Mutual accountability. Because I've learned, as I've shared earlier this afternoon, that people don't always pray when they say they're going to pray. I've discovered that in many times. And so this is an accountability principle, and it helps every one of us to just keep going. Very amazing how this is working. And then the fifth one, the last one, on how to encourage continuous prayer is to encourage the watchman. There's various things you can do to encourage the people. But this very important function as you, as the leader of your group, Maybe now that we can, to have corporate gatherings. Maybe some teaching on prayer. Maybe some weekly prayer, corporate prayer gathering or a worship gathering. Maybe you have on your group maybe an hour once a week where you say, let's focus on this one particular portion of scripture. Let us meditate on it each on our own and let us post some of the revelation we receive. This is one way of having an online Bible study. But this encourages your watchmen. It gives them some food and not just interceding the whole time. And then you must always be on the lookout for the unction of the Holy Spirit. Because you never know when the increase will come. You never know when you will hit the water. So the thing is, at some point in time, a few years back, we felt the Lord wanted us, us to pray every night in our prayer room. And we were seven people. And all seven of us, somehow, supernaturally, had the time available to spend every day of the week, every evening in that prayer room. All seven were praying every night for 40 days. And at the end of the 40 days, the Lord has spoken so much to us, encouraging us from day to day. People will get dreams and visions every night. People were sharing on what the Lord was saying. And that continued and helped us to continue. And unfortunately, when I felt the spiritual breakthrough was imminent, then the December holidays came in. And people were scattered and, and because of family responsibilities and stuff. But you never know when the breakthrough will come. And may the Lord help us that we will see these breakthroughs coming as we faithfully stand in obedience before the Lord. Now the way forward, lastly. We've had nine years now of day and night prayer in terms of the initiative called Seven Days on the Wall. This is an initiative that was birthed in Indonesia in 2012 at the World Prayer Assembly where more than 9,000 delegates 
from uh, various countries around the world gathered for the World Prayer Assembly. There's 9,000 delegates gathering with a prayer agenda from around the world, excuse me. And so at that conference, we had this vision that we felt the Lord was giving us and that he was impressing on our heart that the year of 2013 would be a year of day and night prayer in the local churches all over the world, a focused year of day and night prayer for revival among the nations. We came back to South Africa, we shared it with some leaders, and they felt this is time. And so the Seven Days on the World Initiative was birthed, and from January 2013 up till today, there was groups of people and networks and 24-7 watches and congregations all taking hands to pray day and night for revival in South Africa. And this has grown over the years. We had phases of growth. In the beginning, it was local churches taking a week. Then a year later, it was the first local prayer network started in Paul. And then this phenomenon grew up till today where we have about 60 to 80 of these networks across the nations in about six provinces uh, across South Africa that, uh, that have local prayer networks. And this is mainly groups of churches that would link together in a community. In Bloemfontein, they have more than 16 of these congregations. Every seventh week, they have seven weeks throughout the year. Every seventh week, every week of those seven weeks, they are standing on the wall of their city. And each church take one day of that week. More than one church per day. And so we see this is growing. Now, at this moment in time, this last week, even right before this Watchman School of Prayer, we had a week of day and night prayer for Africa. It's the first one of these seven days on the world that we have spent focusedly on mobilizing prayer for revival in Africa. So we invited all of these networks across South Africa, but also in some of the nations in Africa for the first time, to join in one week to pray day and night for revival. Every day of last week was a different focus on a different country. We had seven countries that we focused on. And they all form this highway up north into uh, Egypt. And so, um, so we had um, Zimbabwe that was praying. Zambia at their 24-7. Malawi at their 24-7. I was on their groups. I saw they were praying constantly 24-7. They were praying for the whole week. And praying for one another's nations, etc. Beautiful week of prayer. And so we are trusting the Lord next year. That right across South Africa and into Africa in various nations, there will be seven weeks throughout the year 2022 where all the different nations will have their own 24-7 prayer focusing on those seven weeks praying for revival in their nation and the nations of Africa. We are trusting the Lord, even beyond Africa, for countries to sign up. The only thing is, the request is, that those countries will just take responsibility for their own 24-7 prayer watch for that week that will focus and represent the, um, the country before the Lord. And so this is what we are seeing for, for next year. Um, apart from that, I have uh, more information that you can find. We will post the website link on the group to get more information on this project and how you can go about organizing your own 24-7 prayer for your nation. Um, please have a look at that. And then lastly, just to close, I have a few books that I want to recommend to you that you can order from our office or uh, maybe you can hear from Lizette whether it's available online. The first one is an inter interactive prayer room manual. This is actually a very nice tool just to explain and give you lots of ideas on how to set up your prayer room uh, in a very creative manner that will make it really encouraging for people to join in with. So this you can find. Um, and then also this book, The Sword, is available in Afrikaans and English, as co is a compilation of scripture in various topics. You can pray for your family. You can pray for the different parts of your body. You can pray for the church. You can pray for all kinds of topics. And the prayers in this book is written straight from Scripture with the Scripture references in between. This is probably one of the best tools that we have.
that can teach people how to pray the word. This is it. So it's one of, the, one of those things that you need to have in your prayer room at least. And then um, this practical tool, Baruch Betzmir, Awaken the Watchman is the English name for this booklet, is simply giving testimonies and guidelines on how to establish day and night prayer in your local congregation, your community, and beyond. This is a, a practical guide. Give very nice guidelines on how to establish this thing in your community. And then lastly, the, the book that I referred to the other night, When God Comes, Vaner God Kom, this is the story of the Andrew Murray revival in 1861 in Wellington and the Boerland here in the Western Cape. And uh, even across the nation, the, the fire spread. So this is the story of that revival. I really want to encourage you to get hold of every kind of video clip and story that you can find on a revival. Read it and send it along. We live in a time where it's very dry, spiritually speaking. And we don't know what revival is. We don't know what we pray for. We don't, if we don't know what to pray for, we don't know what to expect. So let us read about what God has done in the past. And to understand that this is possible. And you know what? Before every revival, there was two or three or four ladies or a group of people, very small. And they would have sought out the Lord day and night, receiving revelation, understanding where, what God wants to do. And they would have this burden that they would cry and weep before the Lord for the status of the church. And they had the fire. They could see somehow. And they would seek the Lord because they had a burden that the church will be ignited. And then at some point, God will answer them. And he will come by his spirit. And so let us pray. Father, we thank you that through your spirit, you come. You came this morning. You came yesterday. You are coming now. And you are igniting our hearts once again. Give us a passion, Lord, for the lost. Give us a real burden for the church. And open our eyes and our ears to see what is on your heart. We need you, Holy Spirit. In this day, we really need you. I pray this afternoon to you, Lord, that is the one that builds your house. And you say that if you don't build the house, the labors labor in vain. And so I pray that you will raise up the watchmen in every community, every nation on this group today. You will raise up the watchmen Call on your people that you will set your people on the walls of cities and nations. That will call upon you, that will watch and pray and give themselves no rest until you come. Lord, we need you in these days. We thank you, Father. Establish your house as a house of prayer for all nations. We bless you. Amen.